to tell you a little bit about Terry. He's, he's over there. Um, Terry Netshai is a licensed architect who has specialized through most of his career in historic preservation projects and downtown revitalization. He has documented many buildings in many historic districts for the National Register of Historic Places. In the 1980s and 1990s, he also worked on regional studies of historic buildings, industries, and ethnic groups, tracing the geographic patterns of Italian Americans, coal mines, glass factories, old stone houses, and log houses, the Underground Railroad, and similar things. He lives in Monongahela in a 100-year-old house his grandparents bought in 1930. His father's family has been in the Monongahela area for over 100 years, and some of his mother's ancestors arrived in this area over 250 years ago. Let's give him an honesty. thing about not being allowed to use the floor is I can take my mask off. <laughs> Do you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I, to, to a fault, I always throw too many slides in, so at this time it tapers off a little, so if everybody ends up leaving. Um, I didn't even think about the debates. I'm probably the most politically neutral person you'll ever find. But um, my talk today is going to be about the geography of the glass industry. And I'll tell you up front, uh, there's a lot of Mon Valley-centric stuff, because that's where I'm from. Um, but actually, it's where the glass industry is from, too. And of course, there's a lot of sand along the river, so there's a lot more to it than that. Um, but I did look through your literature, and I'm actually Really glad to see that you have a historical society. How long has this historical society been in business? Okay. Fifteen. Okay. When I was doing a lot of this stuff in the 1980s and 1990s, there weren't historical societies in most of the South Hills. So it was it's for sure reassuring to see that that's kind of happened in the meantime. And I lived out of the area. Um, I would come back almost once a month because I had clients around here, but I lived for a while in Alexandria, Virginia, and for a while in Western Maryland, Philadelphia, Somerset, PA. But anyhow, I looked through your literature, and I just, because uh, Rosemary was telling me that you had a glass industry history here, and that was news to me. And I'll tell you, I already knew about the railroad history of Bridgeville. I already knew about the Flannerys. I already knew about Vanadium Steel. I already knew about Madison Marie. I just didn't know the glass factory. And I'm, not, I'm kind of surprised because I've done some pretty thorough uh, regional histories. So I won't bore you with your own information that I got off of your website, but I was pretty impressed. Um, there's this whole story that I didn't even know yet. You know, and that was the, these pictures of the factory before it, when it was in Homestead from uh, 1879 to 1907. I didn't know there was a glass factory in Homestead. And then when it came to Bridgeville after 1907, and then, of course, when it became the GE Lake Plant, and um, that was 1918? Is that right? Okay. So I learned something just by being here. And some examples of your glass, and was this all pressed glass, do any of you know? Yeah. Because it, yeah. it doesn't look to me like cut glass, but it looks like it's, you know, imitating cut glass a little bit. Most of it looks like pressed glass. And I'm going to comment for a few moments about Bridgeville. Now, I have a little story. First of all, um, my aunt lived overseas for a while, and her husband died in 1976, and she took me to Holland to help her pack up, and, and she bought a house in Upper St. Clair. So I knew Bridgeville way back then, and that's when I started college. And I have a little story, and I really want you to not be insulted by this story, but I think someone was trying to insult me anyhow. Um, I was in college at Carnegie Mellon, and one of my fellow students was from Scott Township, which I'd never heard of. 
But when he told me where that was, I said, well, Bridgeville's pretty interesting because I was already interested in downtowns. Now, this is what you can't be insulted by. His comment was, Bridgeville's a hole. Now, I've been thinking about that ever since, and I wouldn't tell you a story that's, you know, what is that, 38, 32 years old or 42 years old? 42 years old if I didn't have a reason to. And, and the reason is, 38 years old, right? I'm not doing my math very well up here in my head. Is that his world was suburbia, and Bridgeville's world is something else, and it's a downtown. And my world was already about downtowns, because in Monongahela, we had a big urban renewal project. I thought a lot about how much I loved the old architecture, and I was in college at a time when they were starting to talk about historic architecture for the first time in a long time. But our city got urban renewal money last in line and tore down half of the downtown. And I would come home on the weekends heartbroken. My grandfather helped to build a lot of that, but he was old enough to be my great-grandfather. So I kind of had this search for it. My dad, on my steps and other stuff, but my dad didn't like uh, modern art, so I, didn't, I knew nothing about modern architecture. This is what appealed to me. But I was going to go into trying to revitalize historic downtowns, and I kind of realized from that conversation that for some people, there was this one network, and some things were holes in it, and in my world, he lived in the hole in the reverse. You know, it was like a solid negative. Um, and so I'm focused this way and on the history, and that's why I'm standing here, because I've been doing this kind of downtown and historic work related to architecture ever since I was in architecture school 40 years ago. Now, a lot of what I'm going to talk about with the glass industry comes from the fact that I wanted to work in downtowns, and I got hired in 1987 to be the downtown manager, Main Street manager, for Charleroi, and we wanted to start a glass museum. And I don't know how many of you know anything about Charleroi, but it's, you know, right off of Route 70, and at the Monongahela River near Bell Vernon and Denora, five miles from Monongahela. But it's, um, it was built, it's the only town I know of that has birthday. It was built extremely fast in the 1890s, and they were intending to build a town of 10,000 in 10 years, but they got up to 6,000 in 10 years, and that's pretty impressive. Um, one of the ways they did that, these folks that I'm talking about that wanted to do that were trying to sell little slices of real estate. That's what I'm convinced of. But they created a big glass factory. Pittsburgh plate glass had just been created in 1884 in Trenum three or four, and that's plate glass, which is kind of glass, and up until that moment, architects were using plate glass, but they had to import it, plate glass came into fashion for storefronts around the Civil War, but they had to import it from Belgium and France, and when PPG got started, Belgium and France broke out in riots because the unions were sure that the company was just using this as an excuse to cheat them out of their wages. So um, when the Charlery Group got started, they said, they, they named it for Charleroi, and a lot of people think, well, that's because the Belgians founded it. Not quite true. The Americans founded it, that, that they wanted Pittsburghers to believe that the Belgians were coming to get the glass industry back. And it was kind of like the Belgians are coming, the Belgians are coming. So they put a big glass factory in the middle, which they were the old officers of, and they were trying to give Pittsburgh plate glass a run for their money. And this is in 1890. The glass company didn't do real well, and the scale was huge. Because um, several of the officers died in the first year, and, and there was a depression in 1893 or 4, and they, they had to import new workers because they couldn't beat the wages, and all kinds of things like that. But another glass factory came and located down the river from them on the right, and that was Macbeth Evans. And they were originally, well, I'm going to talk about them in a moment, I'll see where. And then there was a bottle factory after that called Hamilton Bottle. I don't have much at all about bottles in this stuff. Now, I did a project for the Rivers of Steel Heritage Area. Are you all aware of that? And um, I actually was kind of behind the scenes lobbying, and then I got hired. I was lobbying to say they needed to study the Homont Valley and not just tell all the people to pour all their money in the homestead and carry furnace. And um, they agreed eventually that they should do a study, and then I got hired to work on the study, and it was a six county study, and we looked at every industry. And, um, and well, the six industries we focused on, it was river and rail transportation, um, steel, iron, coal, and coke. But of course, glass was mixed in because it was right there, and natural gas and some other things. 
So we figured out all these patterns, and uh, we looked at 3,000 and some sites and drove 30,000, 20,000 miles, I think, in, in a year and a half, looking at all these sites, and wrote up a 300-page book. And now you can go to eBay for this book that I was giving out to historical societies that existed in 1992. It's now for sale for $35. So I don't know that I can afford it. I find things I worked on on eBay and I'm fascinated. Anyway. Um, but it's a 300 page book and it lists all these industries and all these sites and 23 ethnic groups, every Hungarian lodge, which kind of African American Baptists are in this town and which kind in that town and where the Italians are and what part of Italy they're from and all that stuff. We tried to figure out. We figured out how the coke industry provided gas to various other industries. Um, about the chemical industries here. Another project I worked on that gave me a little insight into bridge was just a couple of years ago, and I don't, I'm not going to say I'm going to go into this much, but how many of you have ever heard of the Southern Scene Arch or the neighborhood of Southern Scene? Remember huh? you know where the Wabash Tunnel is off of 51? Yeah. You know there's a, <coughs> today I was looking, they called it an igloo, a salt dome, on the left, right before you get to the Fort Pitt Tunnels. And that was a little neighborhood. There's a couple neighborhoods there. The 51 kind of blew out. But when you go through this arch, there was a neighborhood back in there that was the last rural spot inside the city of Pittsburgh. And for a while, they were the last piece of the township that didn't want to merge. And um, when you go through this arch, the babbling streams just transform this, the worst traffic intersection in western Pennsylvania into West Virginia. You get on the other side of the arch and you swear you're in West Virginia. But that arch was built so that the Wabash Railroad could get to the Wabash Tunnel so they could take the trains to the <coughs> Wabash Terminal in downtown Pittsburgh and turn them around and come back. It was very difficult to build that railroad because there was already a railroad on both sides of the Monongahela River and there wasn't a valley left. So they tried to use Sawmill Run and they, some stretches of it, they told everybody they were creating a streetcar when in, in the end it was part of a major railroad. They're just trying to keep the Pennsylvania Railroad from coming in and shutting them down. And um, that railroad story connects to Bridgeville. So I'm just passing that along. That's one of the places where I learned. And there's a whole story to the engineering of that arch, but that would have to be a whole other time. So I'm going to give you some concepts, and I hope that they'll help you to contextualize your history. Because I haven't been an expert on Bridgeville history all this time, but I do have information on the whole region. Now, this is really the slide about geography, and it has um, many parts to one slide, because it's kind of animated. The glass industry started in our region in two places. Albert Gallatin got glass, the glass industry started in New Geneva, which is way up here. When you look at anything connected to the Monongahela River, up is south, because uphill is West Virginia. And the water flows downhill to Pittsburgh. And James O'Hara started a factory in Pittsburgh at the same time, and those are the two oldest glass factories in western Pennsylvania. But they were followed shortly after by um, one across the river at, at Greensboro, one in Periopolis that didn't last very long, one in Monongahela, and then one outside of Brownsville, and then one, another one in Monongahela, and they, they, they one in Bell Vernon, one in um, Fayette City, and those were places where the early glass industry got established. And they, these factories made whiskey flasks and window panes, because those are the two things that were needed in this area. Uh, there are one or two buildings from the 18 teens that I think might have the original window panes, which fascinates me. Now why along the river? Well, this map is the Mississippi watershed. About 50% of the United States is connected to our area by river. And if you're shipping glass and you all you have is dirt roads and slippery slopes and steep hills and you don't even have a railroad yet, you're going to want to float the glass down river, and maybe after the steamboat comes, you're going to want to ship it up river, too. We had a shipping company in Monongahela that connected the rivers and controlled the shipping all the way to North Dakota. So that's why the glass industry was along the rivers, but you know, also because window panes and flasks and dishes and all kinds of things you would make out of glass were needed in 50% of the United States. 
and it was a lot harder to get there from Massachusetts or Philadelphia or the other places where there were glass industries. But another phenomenon happened, and this happened partly because of the steamboat. They started all these little tiny mines along the rivers because the river is lower than the coal seam, and you can walk right into the face of the river, or face of the coal seam, right along the river. It never floods because it's right above you, above the water. But you can ship it out, you can bring it out on a little railroad and drop it onto a boat really easily. And all these little coal mines started producing coal that could be used for things. Well, Pittsburgh, in 1810, became the first major place in the world to be making almost all of its glass with coal rather than wood. This relates a little bit to later, but this piece of glass I think could be pre-1880, it was something my grandmother had, and it has a gray cast. I think that's from the coal being used. But there was glass from that era in Pittsburgh, or the Pittsburgh area, and I don't consider the Nugget of Pittsburgh, so we're the next city south, and Brownsville is the next place really old above us. But um, there was glass from this region that was being given to kings and queens as gifts. In, in, uh, in Europe as early as the 18 teens. So we were producing things and they were making it different places. One of the reasons for that is the farmers who came west, many, many farmers came out here and they didn't intend to have towns, they just wanted to have these little castles, you know, these little estates, or big estates, 300 acres a lot of times. And they would graze grain and things and take it to the river and ship it to New Orleans and New Orleans would pay them a good price because they were shipping it to England and smuggling it in. So it's no surprise that glass would make it to Europe from this area because even though it's 1,800 miles and it was a treacherous trip with waterfalls and you had to go over on your raft and Indians that might shoot at you or something, um, that's what was happening. It's the grain and the goods from this area, the whiskey and so forth, air skins and things like that, lumber, were going to New Orleans at that time period. So because of the coal mines along the rivers, they were shipping the coal down the river. It's not easy to ship it up river. So all these glass factories that I have on this map here relocated to Pittsburgh. South side of Pittsburgh had, in the coal era, I think 129 or some number like that of glass factories, and that's what made South Side the way it is. A lot of pre-Civil War buildings, a lot of tightly packed things, there were a lot of glass factories in the coal era. What happened next? Well, it was something the Belgians were doing. They figured out that they could use uh, natural gas to make glass, and it would be efficient and clean, and they could get away from the coal industry and the smog, and, and, and also, you know, there, now there was a big steel industry in Pittsburgh that came after glass, and, and iron and other things like that. And um, there was plenty of, plenty of in, uh, institutions to use the coal, but now we're going to use natural gas to make glass. I brought this top hat toothpick holder. I don't know if you can see the difference, but this is what you would find in the natural gas era compared to the coal era. This one's got a black, smoky cast to it, and this has none of that. So natural gas was a big change in the gas glass industry. However, here's the problem with natural gas. It's the opposite of coal. You can't put it all in one place. So you could ship the coal and it all ended up in the same place when it went down river. A lot of people in the Nunghell area were, were mining coal for orders they had in Cincinnati and places like that, Louisville, that they couldn't get past Pittsburgh because there were locks and dams on the Monongahela that made it a canal, and they would get to Pittsburgh, and they had to wait, and hopefully that year there would be a flood to get them down the Ohio. But you had to wait for a flood to ship down the Ohio. And um, therefore, have you ever seen those pictures at Station Square where the entire river is covered with coal barges? That's not Pittsburgh's coal, that's my coal. That's the coal from the Midland Valley that was supposed to go to Cincinnati, or Louisville, or New Orleans, that it got stuck. And, and, and the, it, they didn't have a flood that year. Everybody got laid off, and they had a fire sale, and they hurried up and sold the coal cheaper, and no wonder Pittsburgh kept growing. But with natural gas, you have the opposite thing. 
You can only put so many glass factories in one area before all the natural gas is gone. In fact, you know, 40, 50 years later, they started uh, wiping the gas in from West Virginia and other places because those gas wells were depleted, but they could use them as, as uh, storage tanks underneath the glass factories. So Washington, PA had one of the largest clusters. I think there were 20 some glass factories at one time, right there. Um, there were some in um, Wheeling, Morgantown, West Virginia, and also uh, Point Marion on the, on the Pennsylvania line. In New Martinsville, West Virginia, I put on the left there because they had a connection to Charlevoix. And this is where we cross over into um, the panhandle of West, West Virginia and at the edge of Ohio. And uh, Rochester, Beaver County, Butler, um, Turinum, and, the and New Kensington, and Arnold. Uh, Arnold is a city inside of New Kensington that was a glass making city. And uh, uh, Mount, uh, Mount Pleasant's on there, and Jeanette and Grapeville, which are two side-by-side -side towns. And um, I should have laid them up because that's about as much as I can do. Um, well, Bill Barnum and one of the glass factories moved to New England, next to the Mount Gahala, um, and, and, and three of them moved to Charlotte. Now, One of the things I have a map of is 1920, there were all those glass factories, those are the black dots, at the gas wells, so that's also places, natural gas is pretty much everywhere, but the pockets that were good for the glass industry, and you could pipe it in from the countryside, and from someplace like Washington, whereas you couldn't get across the river as easily. So you had to pipe it in from outside. But that's a cluster map to show you all the glass factories by 1920. And, and Bridgeville's on there. And then um, we have another phenomenon that more recently people talked about the gas belt, which is really also the glass belt in um, Indiana and Ohio. It really starts here. It's just this map of it is on the, it's centered on Dayton, Ohio, and the area around um, Ohio and Indiana. But really that whole pattern continues across. After they got away from the rivers, they were moving up to the railroad lines and went across those areas. So this is kind of a summary. So you know, we, we went from, from independent little glass companies that were started almost by pioneers and their sons to a concentration in Pittsburgh, to everything moving out to a one or two hour driving radius around Pittsburgh. And then, um, so we went from the Mississippi watershed being the important thing to the gas belt or glass belt of Indiana and Ohio. When we talk about glass, most of the time, the stuff, especially the corny glass museum and things like that, that comes up as art glass and really special artistic things you can do. My glass emphasis is utilitarian glass, and I'm an architect, so I'm interested in how glass is used in buildings. But we thought about starting a glass museum in Charleroi when I worked there, and it was going to be a museum of utilitarian glass. So you'll see some other Charleroi products. Um, this is a slide I actually used to talk about how buildings relate to each other. But I said they really should be more than just a row of salt shakers. But salt shakers are an example of pressed glass. And early pressed glass, which is pressed in presses, that's a press on the bottom of the mold, I mean a mold, and the press is on the top. Um, the glass blower blows the bubble of glass and then drops it into the mold, and then it's pressed into the mold. That's one kind of glass. And that's what a lot of the early glass was in this area. That what, I'm not talking about window panes, and I'm not talking about uh, flasks, but I am talking about the other things, like bowls and cups and uh, dresser knobs and things like that. So there are several different kinds of glass. Cast glass is what plate glass is. And I put it first because when you cast glass, it has to be pretty thick. Because it doesn't have any grain in it, it's kind of, if I drew a cross section, I would draw a whole bunch of dots. The molecules just aren't oriented in any one way, and that causes it to break over one lot of faults. Press glass is a little bit better, because now they're moving it in a way that will kind of bring it together so they'll get a little bit green. And blown glass is what you really need for lightweight glass that's strong. Because blowing it like bubble gum, it causes the molecules to stretch and line up and so, to give you a wood analogy, 
Um, cast glass is kind of like masonite. Did you ever leave masonite out in the rain and it just disintegrates it because all it is is really sawdust and glue? Well, that's what cast glass is like. But pressed glass and some of the metal products are like wood, wood with the grain in one direction. So why did they invent plywood? Because if you cut wood in the wrong direction, it's real weak. So if you run it in two directions, you get the strength from both directions. And that's what, um, what's happening with the blown glass and the things they did with it. Um, so it, you know, the, the, the pressed glass is kind of like forged or wrought iron, and um, blown glass is like rolled iron and steel. Uh, some other glass terms, there's a difference between sheet glass and plate glass. I'm not real good on what the difference is, but plate's a little thicker. Flint glass has originally had flint in it to make it crystal clear. Um, optical glass is something that comes up a lot in these glass discussions. And there were some combined methods where you use those different things. Now this is a house in Brownsville that is still standing. It was originally a bank from 1873. And um, we've been working on some plans to try to figure out if it could be a bed and breakfast someday. Well, those windows are four to five feet tall per pane. That's as large as you could make window glass. It's amazing that it's still there. There's some crack pieces, and I just told the council folks, try to leave these in and put the cracks in them, because then you have something highly unusual. This is a building in Monongahela, which was, when I was growing up was my favorite building, but notice it also has the same kind of tall windows, one over one. You, count, you name windows by how many panes up at the top and how many on the bottom. And, um, Somebody might say, oh, it came out of this pattern book, because there's a pattern book that has a similar building. But it doesn't have the same ornament on the top of the windows. And I was in Venice one day, walking around, and I don't know where I was. I've looked at maps of Venice and gone on the street with the street view and tried to figure it out. I don't know which building. But there's one building that they might have copied that top of the window detail from, that might have, they might have had in mind when they designed this building in Monongahela in 1872. By the way, it says in the newspaper article about this building they had to bring the plate glass from France. But the Italian building, look at the window proportions. They're squat. The building in America is taller because in the 1870s, right after the Civil War, people were convinced the only way to be healthy, they only had radiant heat from fireplaces and things like that. The only way to be healthy was to have lots of light and air, so they made the ceilings real high. And with a fireplace, it doesn't make much difference. And therefore, they made the windows real big, so you throw them open and get a lot of air in the building, or you can even pull the top down and get some of that air to come in or out. And so that's why the windows are the way they are. Now, the earlier kind of glass is crown glass. Does anybody know what crown glass is? Ever heard of it? Okay, well, the way you made glass to get that strength from stretching it is you would blow a bubble, and then you would uh, have another worker with you at the other end of your blowpipe, and he would cut the end off of that bubble. And then you would spin your blowpipe on a level surface, and the glass would gradually make itself, if you know what you're doing, while it's still hot, into a, a big disc, and that's called crown glass. And so these guys, this is a very old illustration from 1700s, and then there's a picture of people doing it maybe around 1880. Um, but you, at the center, where you break off the, um, the blowpipe, you have something called the bottom mark. You can't run the pane through the middle. So well, they would often take that last little piece as a scrap and put it above doors and things as an ornament. And you'll find that on really old buildings. Maybe even if you go to Europe sometime, you might see it because it was something they did with the extra glass instead of throwing it back in. But if you go to this, architects always tried to make things in what's called gold section. It's a certain kind of proportions is similar to a piece of paper. Your window pane is in those proportions. Your sash is also in those proportions and your total window. But they're slightly different versions of those gold section proportions. So they would cut the glass out of the circle, but they couldn't use a whole circle because the funnel mark was in the middle. So the wealthier people got the bigger pieces, and the poorer people got the smaller pieces, and so forth. But they would, that's how they would break up a, a disc of glass in the crown glass era. But then something came along called cylinder glass. Anybody ever heard of cylinder glass? Cylinder glass is when you blow a bottle shape, 
and you dangle your blowpipe so the bottle gets longer and longer and longer, and then you cut the ends off, cut it down the side, reheat it, and very carefully flatten it. I knew an old guy that was born around 1900, 1907, in Monongahela, who used to be a Martian. Of course, he's gone now. But he um, told me that when he was a young merchant, they loved it when the glass flatteners came into town from New England, from that glass factory, because they were really high paid for uh, unfolding that glass, because that was such a delicate job, and they would spend more money on Friday than the other guys. Hmm. Now, if we look at um, cylinder glass, existed side by side with crown glass for a while, but then it started to surpass it. And one of the reasons, and I think this is one of my you know how you get it, like a favorite little piece of trivia? Well, they started, they wanted the cylinder to be longer, and you can't make the pipe shorter or the glass blower will burn its lungs. So they started putting bridges and trenches in the glass factories so they could make those real long windows. Now we're talking about those windows that are 48 inches long. That's how they were, they were making a bottle that was four feet or five feet long at the end of a blowpipe standing on a bridge inside the glass factory. That's what cylinder glass is. That era. And that's why I thought it was so important to keep those windows. Now, if you look at all wavy windows, we all know they're wavy, right? But I've seen a lot of old farmhouses where you can see the curve from the crown glass. You know that it was made in a circle. Whereas a lot of downtown buildings you'll find more vertical waves because they use the cylinder glass there. Again, it has to do with the cost. That building I showed you in Monongahela, which is one of the ones he tore down in the 70s. Um, a lot of the buildings around it had two over two, but that one was an expensive building. It had one over one. But the, in the 1870s, that was a sign of wealth. So architectural style influenced the way glass was made. And I would make the inverse argument. I get kind of annoyed. I'm an architectural historian by choice, but not by education. But I get kind of annoyed at the people who went to school for architectural, edu architectural history, because all they seem to do is know styles and they forget there's something behind the style. And what's behind these styles is technology was changing. They were putting bridges in in the glass factory, little things like that. But we go from before the Civil War, all the windows had 6 over 6, or 3 over 6, or 9 over 9, or 12 over 9. They always had multiples of 3, and they always had two sashes with all the same size panes of glass. The glass was dominant. You made the glass panes all the same size, and then the woodworking was considered easier because you could do that on the farm. About 1860, they started doing some four over fours. That's actually a rare pattern. The little kids, when they draw a window, they always draw something like that. Or two over twos, and that goes with the 1850s, 60s, 70s. But then by the 1880s, almost everybody had one over ones. And then they started making square windows instead of round windows. You know, these, their style changes, but they go with the technology change. And then they get to 1900 and they want to revive the colonial era and they start putting the six pane in the upper half and the big pane in the, down, the bottom half so you can look out the window and see real clearly but you can still have a style that says, oh, I'm reviving the 1700s. Now a lot of this has to do with store buildings, which is my story about being interested in downtowns. That's plate glass. They wouldn't have had this kind of store and all the variations on it recessed doorways and all kinds of things if they didn't have plate glass because you cannot blow glass that thick. The funny thing about plate glass is it's low skill. The other glass factories are high skill. The plate glass is cast glass. You just have to cast it thicker so that it doesn't break because it's not as strong because it wasn't blown. So they had these casting tables. This is what they had in Belgium and France, but they had invested in the engineering and the Americans got interested in this, not only because there was a market for it here, but they were trying to break up the, the wage side of the workers, which wasn't quite union yet. It was almost like guilds. In the glass factory, one guy was called Gaffer, and he always, that's short for Godfather. It's just slurred from Godfather, but they hired their relatives. And so each little area in the blown glass glass factories had all your relatives working with you. But they wanted to, the industrialists, capitalists wanted to build really big things and then steal this market so Belgium and France weren't shipping that glass over here anymore. And uh, so they had to build these big casting tables. And these are just some drawings from the, I don't know, early, well, no, the late 1800s 
showing them pouring the molten glass on the casting tables. And that was a photograph probably right around 1900 on the bottom. So we go back to Charleroi, and that's what the big glass factory was in the middle. This is a fire insurance map by Sanborn. Almost every town in America, and I think Bridgeville included, has a map of all the buildings in case they burn down. Pink means that they're made out of brick. And so we're looking at the big plate glass factory in the drawing here and in the Sanborn map there. By the way, this is a Fowler map. I believe there's a Fowler map of Bridgeville. Does any of you know? Fowler's, that was a company that went around and the legend is they went up in balloons, but then somebody else said they didn't. But um, they drew every building in perspective in the whole town in correct orientation to each other. And Sanborn went around and, and they made only a couple copies of these maps, but they sold them to the insurance agents. So when we zoom in closer on the Charlotte Plate Glass Works, we find these gigantic areas where they were doing gigantic sheets of glass like the size of this room, or maybe it was a fourth the size of this room, but then they would cut out a piece for a store window that might be eight feet tall, might be five feet wide, and you had to have something other than blown glass to do that. And then they had a grinding hall where they ground the glass, because you had to grind it because it, it wasn't blown. Blown glass is more smooth and shiny. And then you had to polish it. And that was the process they went through with the plate glass. Well, almost all the store windows you saw that were older than maybe 1950. And Charlotte got the idea, well, let's make it in color so that we can talk people into gluing them on the outside of the building. And that's called Carrara glass. It's named for a kind of marble that was sliced down and glued on buildings, a place in Italy called Carrara. And Vitrolite was a competing company, but Charleroi had invented this, and Hinkichi bought the plant mainly to get this down. Um, and there are a couple other companies. One's called Sanionics. Um, why is it called Sanionics? Well, Sani is because it's sanitary. They sell it for use inside your bathroom because it's just, you know, nothing bad would stick to it. And uh, it's easy to clean. So you'll find it in interiors. And this is a theater building in Charleroi. And when the theater closed, it turned into two storerooms, and then they used Ferrara glass to remodel it. This is not an elegant Ferrara project. But there are two different shades of green glass right here. And on the left is their Isleys, and Isleys, almost as a trademark, was Ferrara glass, usually white. This one's off white gray. But that's the sign of Isleys. And I'm sure you had, I drove around Bridgeville and looked on Google, but not Google Street View just to see if I could. Um, see any Ferrara glass buildings, but I didn't, but I'm sure you have it, because I see a lot of new materials in probably the places. Sometimes Ferrara glass is pretty elegant. This is another building where they, they combine white stripes and black ones. This was a building in Charleroi, not, not a terribly elegant building, not the original design, because the first works kind of belonged to one, but this glass, green glass, was broken, and I stretched all over the place to find more of the jade green glass found a guy who was an Asian hippie, this is in the 80s, who helped somebody like his grandfather put this glass in the last time it was done. Now, it was insured, so all the glass installers had barns full of it, and when they died, you just had to find their widows and get that glass and, and use it to, pursue, to fix it, because they kept stockpiles of every color they had ever used. Now, the, the Macbeth plant in Charleroi, which eventually became Corning, in between it was called Macbeth Evans. The guy, uh, Macbeth, was originally a patent medicine salesman in Pittsburgh. You know, they don't have a very good reputation, snake oil type stuff. But he started making his own bottles, and pretty soon he was in the glass industry. And he decided to move to Charleroi and open this gigantic plant to make oil lamp chimneys in 1893. Anybody see anything wrong with that? Electricity was coming in, and oil lamps were about to go out of you know, that become dinosaurs. Fortunately for the Charleroi plant, which was supposedly the largest oil lamp chimney plant in America, the Galveston hurricane happened in 1900, and there were thousands of people that died. It was the worst natural disaster in American history for casualties. And they shipped all these oil lamps down there because electricity wouldn't work. And now what do we call an oil lamp? A hurricane lamp. So that's what kept the factory going, but when they also got into glass globes. They started making white glass because electricity was too bright and you needed something to diffuse it. 
and they started making headlights for cars. They made all the headlights in the first couple of years. This is 1918. This book that these pages are from is 1918, the same year GE came here. Um, they also made those glass tops for the uh, gas pumps on the bottom right. And the boulevard light, which you can barely see, but it's like a city light along the street. And um, they made lighthouse lenses, which I'll talk about in a moment if I'm not out of time. At the bottom left is a pink dog with depression glass dish. What do you do when none of the municipalities can afford lamps anymore? What do you do when nobody wants a lighthouse, when gas companies aren't buying tops for their gas pumps? You stamp the glass out and make dishes. And a lot of the dishes made in Charlotte were white because they had the white glass for the lighting. They also introduced a number of other products. And if I worked at I could have worked in a lot of other glass factories. But glass block was introduced in Charlotte and it was originally solid. And I like to show this because as an architect, I think the left use of glass block is really elegant. But putting it in window openings, I kind of don't like. And one reason is it gets broken, you know, it gets vandalized, and it's really hard to replace. But it also just doesn't look right. But the solid glass block, that would be a different thing. Um, not maybe the Charlotte Road, but rolled glass. You've probably all seen with a pattern rolled into it for your bathroom window or your office window. Um, there are a number of patterns that have names. This is Florentine in the middle there. Um, and the, the one up for the top is a prismatic glass tile. They put these in letting, like stained glass came in across the top of the storefront, and it would cause diffused soft light to go into the storefront and get back into the back. Because originally, they did, you know, the storefronts were designed without light bulbs. And here's an example in Somerset. I did downtown in Somerset for three years, and we did replace the glass in this transom area. But do you notice there's a little bit of purpleness on the not others in the squares? That's because they make the rolled glass with manganese, and manganese gradually turns purple, so when you replace a piece, it's going to be a different shade, and eventually it'll be purple, too. This is a little piece of glass here. I used, to, I, I used to do the newsletter for the Washington County History and Landmarks Foundation, and we had a member. The name was Climax Molybdenum. Oh, I just thought, I don't know. Who would name somebody Climax? <laughs> I was trying to figure that out. It turns out that's the name of a company that makes this metal called molybdenum, uh, molybdenum that they use in the heating of glass. <laughs> so uh, I learned something. The stained glass was also made in our area. And actually, I worked on this railroad depot. And we're working on it again. It's becoming a bank in Connellsville, West Connellsville. But it was a stained glass factory for a while. And I was married for a while. We lived in Alexandria, Virginia. And my wife was going to take up stained glass. And one of the three places the stained glass studio had was from Yakovani Glass in Collinsville, all the way in Alexandria. So there are only a few places, I guess, around the country. Uh, Morgantown, I think, has glass factories that make uh, stained glass. And so that's another specialty. And it's a kind of rolled glass that you try to or, or cast glass as you try to get it to look irregular because that's part of the whole effect. Now here's the timeline. There were all these innovations. 1608, the first American window glass opened in Jamestown, Virginia, and then crystal was developed up to the 1760s, and crown glass was made in England in the 1670s, and Western Pennsylvania first had glass in 1797, and Pittsburgh started shipping out coal-fired glass in 1810, and the sandwich glass place opened in Cape Cod in 1825. And larger cylinder glass came along, and then cylinder glass equipped crown glass, and Pittsburgh plate glass opened. And we, you've heard some of this stuff. That's all in a nice sequence. What relates to your glass factory is that they invented blowing machines to replace the human lung. First, Libby Owens did in 1900, and then there was a lover cylinder drawing machine process in 1903. And I'm pretty sure it's those innovations that allowed General Electric to start drawing out the glass tubing, because they had to have some way to get the air without the human lung to make, to make those light bulbs. And if anybody has any better explanations, let me know if I'm wrong. Um, but there are other, other innovations that happened over time. Eventually, it was all float glass. and. There's something called the Pittsburgh process and the Penn Vernon process, which I think has something to do with Bell Vernon. 
um, Colburn was an English process. And um, but they, at one point, they were drawing the glass upward out of the molten mix to get it stretched without the human lung. And they actually built a big tower for this in New England. And the borough passed a special tax on that process, and the tower never got used. But after that, they came up with float glass, which floats on lead, on molten lead, and that's what most of the glass we see today is. I got to work on a couple of lighthouses. One was a small lighthouse on the river. They don't, that lighthouse lens is only this tall. It sits on a table, and it's in like a little house. And the, the lighthouse um, keeper lives in the little house, but he has to go up and, into the light and check it to make sure that Initially, they use whale oil to make sure the light doesn't go out or some ship will run right into the shore. But the ones along the ocean, like in the Outer Banks, how many of you have been to the Outer Banks? They are 150 feet tall, and they have to be located within about 300 feet of each other. And that lens is taller than me. And I worked on Body Island, which I think that's Body Island there. Um, I got to go into it all the way up the spiral staircase, which was broken when I went up, and it was still went up. Um, and uh, what they do is called a Fresnel lens. If you have a lens, to, to, you have to shed, the, the light has to go out 18 miles across the ocean. And on a foggy night, it has to be seen for as far away as possible. And some of them flicker so that they'll be able to see it. But when you have this lens, you're not going to make an eight foot tall lens that has this big curvature in it. It's too complicated. They would cut it in concentric circles and flatten it out, and it would do the same thing. If you like taking a pair of thick glasses and cutting them in, in, in concentric circles and flattening them out, and that's what all these shapes are. But all of those things had to be hand ground from, I guess, plate glass in like France. And the only place that ever made them with machining outside of Europe was in Charlotte, where they, mold, they, they actually made these into molds and made molded ones, and they made the ones where they hand them them out. This actually has the name of the French fast person that made most of them around the world. The one, this is in Edenton, North Carolina, and that one's in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. But this one on the left at the bottom says F. Bar Barbier and Company, and that's, that's the main number of those hand ground lenses. That even has to be in a special putty. And this shows you the spiral stair in the inside of Body Island. Um, here's how the see them taking the lens and breaking it down into pieces, theoretically, so that they can make a shape that will throw the light out 18 miles. Again, I could have found other things made in this area. They made uh, wire glass in Point Marion. They made uh, something similar in um, Floreth outside of Orima by West, West Elizabeth. Um, but the, the tile for the Holland Tunnels was made in Charlotte where it's glass. And they made gauge glass, which is little pieces of really thick glass that the molten metal could go through when they were gauging with the hot water could go through so that um, they could gauge how hot their mix was in the steel mills and other places. But during the Depression, they made all this depression glass. And um, I know that you know, some of your glass shows up in depression glass literature that it's different because it's um, earlier. Um, but this, um, these are some of the patterns, and I brought some. This one's called, I, well, I went to graduate school in Mississippi for a year, and I went to the mall looking for anything to do, and I found a book of depression glass patterns. I'm so homesick. I was never so happy. And it was just drawings, you know. But I got to learn about all these patterns, so I memorized them. This one's called Pie Crush. And it's a slightly off-white color glass, so it might be Cremax glass or a blend. This one's American Sweetheart. And, and do any of you have any, any dishes like this? You can put a dark tablecloth behind it, it makes like a lace pattern. I bought this one in Philadelphia, it was really cruddy. Here's a tip on old glass. I didn't know what I was going to do with this thing because I couldn't get the dirt off. I got an old toothbrush and some toothpaste, and it, it came out just wonderful. This is called petalware, and it's unusual because it's hand painted. Somebody gave me a big set of this. And it's got a petal shape on the back, again, which show up against the tablecloth. 
because it's lighter glass and the white isn't as dense. And but they hand painted these poinsettias on it. Somebody, when we were going to start the glass museum, handed us a bag with some of these in them, in it. And this woman's story was everybody in Charlottesville stole glass from the glass factory and took it home. I tried to have a glass antique sale. And the dealers wouldn't come to Charlotte because they didn't want anybody to see what they were charging. They wanted to keep buying these basements full of stuff that was stolen from the factory. So Lois brings me this bag and she says, I've got a great story for you today. This is Christmas glass and my uncle wanted it for a Christmas gift, but he didn't have the nerve to steal it. But he watched this other guy and the guy had a brown paper bag with a handle and every day he would walk out and set it on the other side of the fence. And when he went home that day, he'd take it home with him. So while, while he was on his shift, he set the glass outside. Well, Lois's uncle or uncle-in-law or something caught on to this and he took the bag home instead. So that's the glass that we got that had two sides on it. But these, this came from a different source. And then you've all seen the Pyrex type things, which Pyrex was introduced in 1914. They just had a centennial about uh, six years ago. And uh, every diner in America was using Pyrex. Um, it's, it's a special way to make the glass turn into something like plywood. They cool it in a certain way that causes it to turn into layers, and the outside layers have more tension. I took a piece of cullet. Cullet is the um, waste product that drips off. They throw it back in, and I was on a tour of the glass plant, and I thought, nobody will care if I take this one piece. I used to twirl it the size of a pencil, and I would twirl it while I was on the phone. One day it exploded. If it's not annealed properly, it explodes. And it exploded, and the entire room had sand on every surface. Um, there was no glass in my hand. I said, I gotta get off the phone. <laughs> Figure out what happened. Well, that's, they, have to, they have to cool it a certain way in order for it not to be explosive. And one time they had glass stored in a factory from Charlotte, in a factory in Mount Vernon, and there was a fire that broke out. And they had to hire guards to stand there so nobody would go in and steal that glass and take it home because their kitchen cupboards would have exploded. This Pyrex cup is a version of one developed for the Navy. The original one had no handle. But I got a whole bunch of these at a, at a, a consignment shop once, and my mother loves it. She's a big tea drinker. Um, so she has a bunch of my cups. But um, I also have one somewhere that has no handle, and that's because of the Navy. And you've probably all seen the um, uh, syrup containers sometimes creamers from the diners. Diners use Pyrex, white Pyrex forever. But this one's so old that it actually has, we've got that in the symbol on it, which is a glass book. And I held this up before, but I believe this might be L.A. Smith glass, which is one of the glass, glass, glass factories outside of Europe, in the region, in, in Mount Pleasant. Okay. I can wrap up, I can tell them at the end here. So. These are just more examples of depression glass. Um, and again, I could have included a lot of other factories. A lot of it came out of Grapeville, which is next to Jeanette. Um, Charlotte and Jeanette were copies of each other. And then the Pyrex with the mixing bowls from the 60s, which all of a sudden antique shops were popping up, just specializing in this stuff about 10 years ago. Uh, this is a pattern called Princess Ware. When I was a little kid, my grandma had oatmeal every day. And inside of the oatmeal came the square box. There'd be a dish. And she would sometimes squeeze the box because she didn't want any more cups she wanted the sauce. You know. uh, but that's Princess Ware from the 60s that they used to put in the oatmeal boxes. And of course, we've probably all seen Vision's cookware. And this is called a rainbow bowl. It was invented by one of the, suggested by one of the glass factory workers in Charlotte. It's two coats of paint on the outside of a clear bowl so that you get two colors. But neither color is exposed to the inside of the mixer or whatever it might scratch. And um, corn flour, corn ink, which is a big deal. Um, at one point, they couldn't make cups there because there was a problem with the cups and microwaves, and they were making them in Japan. And I'm, I'm going to close on this slide. You let me go this long, thank you. <laughs> um, one of the things with all the Belgians coming to Charlotte, and they came to this area too. McDonald had a Belgian community, and Cecil had a Belgian community. So we studied all these ethnic groups. But the one family in Charlotte was the leader of the Belgian French language socialists around the United States. And we think, you know, oh, there's this evil political stuff. And I told you I'm extremely neutral. 
that this guy published a French language newspaper and nobody who was supposed to set socialism ever caught on, that the Belgians were very um, tight. They worked together on things and tried to average things out. They had a co-op store in Charleroi. And this printing plant is still there. I mean, his grandson ran it until a few years ago. And he had an automatic feeder for the illegal tickets he was printing for people. Uh -huh. um, but he decided that he'd rather just do it the old-fashioned way. He threw the feeder away and just and fed the pieces of paper. And it's now owned by the Charleroi Historical Society. So how long did I run my two hours? Thank you. <laughs>